Okay, then let's have a look at Heroes of the Narm, part of the Lock and Load tactical system. I'm setting up a small scenario here called the Cavalry, um, which has got a, a contingent of New Zealand uh, troops trying to rescue a downed American aircrew, who I've already popped on the map there, and trying to capture that downed American aircrew is this group of VC, seven squads of VC, with a BAR and a leader. So this is a tactical game. Um, it's obviously played in turns, so within turns each side gets impulses that go backwards and forwards and you basically activate um, stacks. I'm simplifying substantially here, but you basically activate stacks and decide to do something with them, which will generally either be moving or shooting, because um, you can't do both with again some exceptions um so you basically move or shoot with a stack and then your opponent moves or shoots with a stack and so on and it moves backwards and forwards until both sides have got nothing left or pass that's roughly the way it works um uh looking at the counters uh, very quickly again very standard tactical stuff like um the squads here vc squads the along the bottom you've got a firepower of one, a move, uh, sorry, a range of four and a movement rate of three. Top right, you've got their morale. Um, the BAR here just has a firepower and a range, one and six. And this leader here has a morale of six. Top right, a, a leadership range of one and a movement of five. We can get into um, some of the complexities around these things as we play. Over on the um, New Zealander side um, you can see the squads have got one M74 in a red box so that is one firepower but two in melee that's what the M stands for seven range and the four in a red box means they can assault move which means they can make a half move and then fire with a minus two penalty. Um, the M60s here have got two firepower and ten range. Um, and then they've got warrant officer level here, 616, morale, range, movement. They've got a scout. You can see um, some separate things for him. He's got a four in a yellow box. That's interesting. That means he's got stealth movement, um, which means he does not get spotted uh, if he's moving through degrading or or if you're not moving through open terrain then then he is not spotted by uh, by being by moving which most things are that's interesting of itself but um he also has some other really interesting powers he can allow things that he's stacked with to pay less movement uh costs for moving through the terrain like a uh, light jungle heavy jungle woods and so on so he can allow stuff moving with him to move much quicker he's got much better spotting rolls than other things he can assault move so he can move half and still fire um he's got lots of he's got lots of cool powers he's a very serious hombre and then down here we've got a medic who can essentially heal wounded things and rally a squ or rally a squad um, but you see he hasn't got a leadership range because he's not a leader, he's just got a morale and movement. So yeah, the um, the basic concept of this is that we're going to roll a die each at the beginning of each turn to see where this guy moves and he'll gradually move south, one, two, three, four, five, six, so he'll wind his way in some random pattern across this map and he's worth six VPs to the Viet Cong if they can get him, if they can capture him in melee and get him off this map edge down here between the road and the bottom corner. And this group are coming on where the green die is and are trying to prevent that from happening because it's worth 6 VP to the Viet Cong. And if uh, he doesn't get captured and taken off the map edge, then we're on a pure body count to determine um, victory with each half squad eliminated of the opposing side worth a victory point. So a full squad being worth two and single man counters like leaders and scouts and so on being worth two as well. Eight turns, um, and we'll see how this goes. Uh, like I say, I'll kind of, I'm not going to give, try and give a full rules explanation, um, just a, a flavour, and we'll get into some of the more interesting uh, nuances of this scenario um, as we go. Okay, we're coming into turn one then here in the cavalry, Heroes of the Narm, Lock and Low Tactical. I've set the VC up. 
the American crashed American aircrew is on the board and we're ready to go with the New Zealanders ready to come on. They have the initiative in this first turn. The, the first thing we have to do is work out where the American aircrew is going to go. I'll just talk about the uh, VC setup. Very simple. We've the stacking limit is normally three three squads. So they've got three squads with their leader, one with the BAR, and then they've got another three here. So we're set up all our squads as close as we can to the um, American air crew to go looking and spread out through the jungle looking for them. And we've got um, a guy here because of the stacking limits there. Uh, also, Heavy Jungle has a stacking limit of two squads, so we've got to be careful that we don't go uh, messing that up as we start moving into Heavy Jungle. Um, and that's about it. Uh, another interesting um, thing to point out in this is that although um, these guys have got a movement of three and stuff moving with a leader can have a plus two double time uh, bonus so can move five, um, in this scenario the VC are only allowed to move two hexes maximum for the first two turns I think simply to prevent them rushing straight across before anyone has a chance to do anything. Um, particularly because normally light and heavy jungle cost two movement points um, but for VC they only cost one so they're jungle capable. <laughs> um, so yeah um, that's the VC setup then let's roll a dice to see where our American air crew is going we'll just give it uh, and that's a one and so he is coming in here <clears throat> that's uh, not good for the uh, for the rescue mission anyway good for the VC right so now we're going to get um, a first impulse with um, the New Zealanders and they want to bring as many troops onto the board as quickly as possible so we will take our maximum stack which is two single man counters and three squads um, so level and the scout and two guys with M60s and another squad and that is the biggest stack you can have pretty much in a in a in a game now they will be able to double time so they've normally got four movement but with uh, level they can have six and the scout will reduce the cost of um, jungle hexes to one so he acts a bit like the VC he can he can lead the way um, very quickly through jungle terrain so he's great we will move these guys six and they will come one two three four five and into this light jungle here for six um, with the idea of cutting around this hill which would otherwise just slow us down for no good reason and trying to get through the jungle towards our crew that way um, we could have come this way, but I mean, that's not. Uh, so they will get a moved uh, marker uh, to show that they're done. Um, we should also put a low crawl on this crew because he has technically low crawled. He's moving one by low crawl. And now that's the um, that's an impulse done for the New Zealanders. So the VC are going to get a go. Um, so Arnat, now Arnat with his with their leadership of one, um, range of one, could technically activate their own hex and this hex and this hex and have everything move all at the same time. The difficulty with that is that stuff, if you activate a hex and everything in it, everything has to move together and we know that they can't all move together because they're going to breach the stacking limits of the heavy jungle so you know it, it's a moot point here because it doesn't really matter we're not really gonna the way the um, New Zealanders have moved we're not really going to come into contact with them so we're just going to push forward towards the guy there um, but yeah if we were to activate everyone using Arnat's leadership um, then we'd be prevented from moving together and we'd be leaving people behind. So we're just going to activate, you know, um, two guys here. You don't have to activate everyone in a hex if, if you don't want to. So we're just going to activate two guys here and uh, and send them this way uh, and mark them as, as moved. 
Um, and then over here, this medic and this squad are going to come on. Actually, I think the medic's going to come on alone because he's got six moves. So he might as well try and move six. So he'll just come one, two, three, four, five, six, straight up the edge of the board. He can't move through the jungle with the with the one rate because he's not with the scouts. So he, he'll stay in open ground for now and just move as far as he can. That's them done. Over here, Arna, um, this guy will push up into here for two okay that's all good um so we've got one squad who's going to get left behind as a bit of a straggler because he's only got four move he's not going to double time with the leader and he's not got a scout picking it uh, helping him move so he's just going to come one two three four and um we'll see how this goes and then Arna over here, and now the uh, Anzacs are now out of activations because everyone's done something. So Arna, uh, two squads with a BAR, can just slide in here and is done. And then as two separate activations, would slide that one in there and that one in there. And they've spread out through the, uh, through the jungle uh, looking for an American aircrew. So that's the end of turn one, and in the administration, that's the end of the operations phase. So we go into administration phase where we remove admin markers and smoke and star shell markers and so on. So we can take all these moved markers off and start uh, turn two, which will start with a roll to see which direction our air crew moves in. And um, and then we will make an initiative roll to see who's got the initiative on turn two. So let's just take that low crawl off. Let's uh, give it a die roll for the uh, air, the air crew, the lost air crew. Oh, and they're going the wrong direction again. And they have come into here via low crawl. That is not good at all. And now we'll roll an initiative roll. And it's VC with a 2 and the US with a 1. So we go into turn 2 with VC initiative. Okay. Well. I think... Interesting. I think we have got two choice. Well, again, we're not likely to come into contact with the uh, New Zealanders this turn, and we're going to get very, very close. We can only move two hexes. Um, but all right. Well, let's just pile forward here into here. Now, interestingly, uh, this crew is not controlled by the. Uh, I mean, he's he's just randomly wandering the jungle. He's not. He's uncontrolled essentially. So I don't think he gets a shot. Um, mm, he wouldn't get a shot anyway because he's already low crawl, crawled. So he's he's acted for the turn. So you know, often if you'd moved adjacent to something like that, they'd have line of sight to you. They'd have you spotted because you're adjacent and you've moved and they'd get some opportunity fire at you. But that isn't the case because he's low crawled and he's not even player controlled. So we're just going to come in here and uh, get ready to to capture him. And now it's up to. Um, now it's up to the Anzacs to do something sensible. So I think we're going to have to take level the scout um, and two squads into the heavy jungle. Obviously we can't take three in because of the stacking limits. But this lot can now move six and the scout reduces the cost of the terrain to one. So we are going to have to leg it as fast as we can over towards our guy. One, two, three, four, five, six looks good. And uh, I think there's going to be a bloodbath next turn. But <laughs> yeah, that's that's the way it goes in this game. Um, right.
now we've got a VC move. So how much risk does Arna want to take? That is a question. Um, I think we'll move a VC squad just straight out into the open here. He can't be shot at. Um, we just want that air crew. We're going to do everything we can to put um, squads of ours in place to capture it. Um, and it's over to these guys, the medic or um, the squads. Now, these guys are going to lag behind somewhat. Um, because now this guy can only go one, two, three, four, because the jungle costs him two and he's only got four movements. So he's now very slow. Over here, um, we'll slide some VC in here. The medic can come one, two, three, four, five, six and join this squad. Now, Arnat, where's Arnat want to go? So here's the thing. If you have squads that are shaken, um, they can only rally if they have a um, leader with them. Um, so it's very hard to recover your, your shaken units because your leader's got a lot of work to run around and try and make rally rolls. So that leads me to wanting to keep Arna with the bulk of the rest of my forces, at least somewhere where she might be able to get involved with rallying things that have become shaken. So I think the sensible thing is to keep her kind of in reserve, even though one of her squads has got the BAR. Hmm. I think maybe actually she will take leave a squad with the BAR there. No, I think she'll leave a squad there and come around here with the squad with the BAR. No, that seems absolutely ridiculous. Um, because they've only got a range of four. What I don't want to do is put them in a position where where there's the potential for them getting shot at a range that they can't fire back. And there's this all this open ground here, and we wouldn't want the we want to keep the fighting close if possible. Um, so I think I will stick with my original gut instinct and move them both round here. Um, with the idea that they can drift back into this jungle if they need to. So the other thing about the VC, and in fact what we're going to do is move them back here. Because one of the things with the VC is they can ambush, which means if they move into melee from a hex that wasn't in line of sight of the enemy at the beginning of the turn, for example, um, there's no line of sight between these troops here. If these guys manage to get these into melee, their um, their combat factors are tripled for that for that melee combat. Um, so they're very dangerous ambushes in jungle, which means keeping them out of line of sight gives you extra opportunities to be dangerous. Um, and that's what Ar I've just tried to do with Arnat there, knowing that we can move three next turn, so that. You know things moving forward too much it, we could pounce on them and maybe both be tripled and go into melee combat with a lot of combat factors so that's our thinking with Arnat and also I, as my only leader um, to rally I want to kind of keep her out of harm's way whereas I'm forced to use a uh, uh, level quite aggressively here because I need him for the double time bonus to get actually to the air crew okay um that's enough waffling about that this guy's only got four movement points he's going to come one into here 
two for the light jungle and one up the hill, which is denoted by this shading. Um, so that will be three, four, um, but that's the best he can do. Otherwise he just ends up there for three and can't move any further. He might as well be cutting this way. Um, and that is the end of the operations phase. All our moved markers come off again and we will go into a new turn working out where the air crew goes. Now, two of the die rolls, um, two of the die rolls that the um, air crew could make would see them <laughs> low crawl into a hex with enemy units. There's nothing to in the rules to suggest they won't do that and they are technically melee capable. Um, they've got a zero um, firepower which becomes a one in melee with a minus one on their dice roll um, but yes they will I think they will attempt to melee enemy units if that's the dice roll they won't just avoid them um, seems a bit strange but uh, there it is uh, that's the way I'm I'm playing it I'm not automatically trying to move them away from enemy units um, so yeah let's roll to see where they go and they get a four. <laughs> okay, so they are going to low crawl into here and then melee in the open. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> right, this is going to be interesting. So, um, oh, we ought to make an initiative roll as well just to see who's got the initiative here and it's still the VC in turn three. Okay, right, so we've got a melee here. The um, crew has got a melee rating of one with a minus one on the dice roll cause, because they're actually a zero and the VC have got a melee rating of one with no modifier. So if we come down here onto the melee table, uh, a one to one you need an 8 or more on 2d6 to call to inflict a hit. Uh, so both sides are going to get to roll. Um, there's no ambush here or anything else. because We're in the open, so it's not even... They have line of sight to them. Um, that wouldn't matter anyway. The VC only get those ambush uh, modifiers on their own impulses, uh, as far as I can tell in the rules. Right, the Americans' aircrew is going to roll um, 2d6. They need... A nine minus one will be eight to inflict um, a loss, and they've got an eight minus one is a seven, and they have not inflicted a loss. Um, and the VC get a plus one um, because because of the zero rating, so they get two dice with a plus one. They've got an eight plus one is a nine, and um, they have captured. The air crew in melee. Uh, they are having meleeed. They are technically spent or activated. So I'm going to take that low crawl off, and I'm just going to mark this stack up as ops complete, like that, to show that they've all activated. And now we've got a VC uh, turn. And I'm going to have to give some thought to what to do here because it's, it's not straightforward. Um, this stack here is incredibly threatening. I mean, it's got overwhelming firepower compared to us. Um, on the other hand, if we can ambush it... If we can ambush them, then we've got some chances uh, to, to, to inflict losses on them. But the firepower they've got in a straight fight is unpleasant. Um, and with these guys wandering around in the open, it's very, very dangerous to, <laughs> to go out there and have no cover at all. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what to do. Yeah, I'm going to have to give it some thought. Okay, turn three here in Heroes of the Nam, the Cavalry. 
And I've been considering um, the situation for the VC, and I think to explain some of these thoughts, it's necessary to talk a little bit about how fire combat works. So this ANZAC group here um, basically has a, a lot of firepower in it, and, and the way combat, sort of small arms combat works in this is that the attacker rolls a d6 and adds <coughs> their firepower and any modifiers and the defender rolls a d6 and adds usually just terrain modifiers and if the attacker gets a higher score than the defender then the difference is uh then they take then they've scored a hit essentially and you take the difference then between the attacker's roll and the defender's and you roll that a new d6 and apply that as a modifier um to a damage roll on each unit and you're trying to get higher than their morale to shake them and if you get double their morale or more then you cause casualties and if you get triple their morale you eliminate them um that's the basics <clears throat> and you can shake leaders and cause wounds and so on but yeah the, the fundamentals are you compare an attack roll to a defense roll if the attack roll is higher then the difference is then a modifier on the damage roll um now, this group here, the other thing to understand is that you have a lead unit. If you attack with multiple units, you have a lead unit, and then everything else contributes half its firepower. But still, this group here with um, a one firepower squad with a two firepower M60 is three, and the other one would be three as well, halved um, to one and a half. So that would be four and a half firepower rounded up to five. So they've got a base plus five on their d6 roll they've got a leader he's worth plus one so that's plus six so they've got a basic sort of plus six on a dice roll if they're attacking if they advance uh if they assault move that would be minus two so they then have a plus four but the jungle is worth plus three the heavy jungle is worth plus three for the vc light ju jungle is worth plus two so you can see that you know they're getting the better of it even assault moving um if the vc were to say charge them let's say the vc were to charge them these two units decide to try and engage them in an ambush so we want to get them into melee and we charge forward through the jungle here and here um to try and get into melee combat with them which would be great if we could um because we'd be tripled um so our firepower of one would become three and we'd have six firepower going into that melee the trouble is in this hex here they could opportunity fire at us because as an adjacent unit we'd automatically be spotted they'd have their six firepower They'd have a plus two for us being adjacent, that's eight. And they'd have a plus one for us being moving units, and that would be a plus nine. So they'd have a D6 plus nine on the attack, and we'd have a D6 plus three on defence. And that's not a tenable position. I mean, I'll just show you what happens. Um, the green dice is the US, so um, that's a great roll for the VC. And they get at their best roll six, so they've got a nine defence. But the Americans have still got... Um, 14 in attack and that's a plus five damage check for each unit and they've only got a morale of four so the first unit gets a six what, what did i say it was a plus five damage check so six plus five is 11 and that would be um on here 11 is not quite three times their morale but it's more than double their morale a good order multi-man uh, counter roll greater than double morale less than three times that would be casualties and then plus five um three plus five eight that's um greater than equal double morale so that would be casualties they they would both be shaken casualties they'd be replaced by shaken half squads and they wouldn't actually get into combat and that would just be a, a sort of typical rollout of that result so you can see that you know unless you get exceptionally lucky that that kind of move against that group is suicide. Um, the only way to do it is if they've already acted and therefore haven't, they've got a fired or a moved marker on it and haven't got the opportunity fire capability. So we need to be quite reactive here as the VC. And then the question is, well, 
we can't really stop them from just ploughing in here and recovering. You know, they've got more than enough capability, uh, firepower to, to defeat us in melee and um, free their air crew. It's just a question of what we can then do uh, to prevent that. Um, which is having Arnat back here ready to go into melee, having guys here to take opportunity fire, having guys here to take opportunity fire. So actually looking at it, we're not badly positioned. If the, if the, if the New Zealanders want to run through this jungle and try and melee us to, to, to whittle away our defences before they recapture the air crew, um, well, we've then got all the bonuses from adjacent shots and um, moving targets, and so we would have our one firepower plus half, so two firepower. Let's say they came through the jungle here and here and tried to melee us. We'd have our two firepower. They're adjacent, that's plus two. They're moving, that's plus one. We've got a plus five, and they've got plus two def I think they'd only have plus one defence from the jungle. So again, the 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 um, there'd be something of a uh, that would be something of a suicidal move for the Anzacs. Yeah, the light jungle would be plus one defence for them. So we'd have a plus. What did I say? A plus five attack and a plus one defence. You know that that's looking pretty difficult to survive for the Anzacs. So. Neither side wants to rush each other, I don't think, um, in this situation. Not not when there's so much opportunity fire still around. And so what that leads me to think is that I want to minimise my uh, uh, reduction in my, in my capabilities. So I think I want to move this guy here. Um... somewhere where he can be more threatening so that we retain our opportunity fire and our melee capability of these units to, to keep him honest. So all I'm going to do is move this guy one, two, three. Now technically this guy has an opportunity fire shot through this light jungle here at this guy right now um, so um, and he, he obviously doesn't want to take it because that's then that, that that's this stack then used up for the turn and and that's our main force so he's going to have to let him slide in here but just to say he did have that shot although this Jungle would count as degrading terrain and count as minus two. I think the brush would give him some cover as well, although I could be wrong. No, it doesn't. It counts as degrading terrain, but it has a target. But it negates the plus one moving or moved penalty. So um, this shot through here would have the six firepower that we calculated. Minus one, minus one, so it would be a plus four. So it would be a really, really lethal shot. It's just that, um, it's just that it's not getting anything done that the Anzacs need to get done. Shooting at this guy, we're we're almost trying to kite him to try and get him to do something silly, um, but he's not going to. Um, so he's just going to have a move marker there. And now we've got the problem of what to do with um, with the Anzacs. And they've kind of in a similar position in that we've got a bit, we don't want to commit with this guy yet because that frees up all the rest of the VC to do stuff. So we need to retain our punch from this stack, which is what's keeping all this lot honest. Otherwise, if we, if we go move somewhere silly, then they can, uh, we can't opportunity fire and then they can uh, jump us in. <laughs> in uh, melee combat or or reposition or you know they've got the freedom of the park then so we're probably going to move up these guys um and we'll get a bit of this uh, cat and mouse backwards and forwards until um someone has to make a decision 
uh, a critical decision about what they're doing with these groups. So it's kind of crunch time in Heroes of the Nam here. Um, the um, sort of squads of the Anzacs have moved up to try and join their main force. Um, the the uh, VC have moved some up and then passed. They've just passed again. Um, and, you know, the onus is on the Anzacs to try and rescue this air crew because the VC will happily whisk him off into the forest next turn if, 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 given the jungle next turn where they can now move three and it'll be very hard to catch up. Um, so they've got to solve the problem of what to do here with this lurking in the background, but what to do here to try and rescue that air crew without leaving themselves open. And I think they've reached the conclusion that they've got to split this group up, otherwise they just they don't, they don't get enough actions to get stuff done. Um, so if you if you took the view that Lovell was going to leave a, lead a squad with an M60 out into the open here to melee these guys because they can't fire into um, a hex with a friendly unit, so that complicates matters for them. So they can't they can't just fire at the um, at the VC. You can't fire into a hex with friendlies. So. They've got to get in here in melee, but obviously it's in open. If they had units in here in the open and this group was still to act, they've got one firepower plus half is um, one and a half rounded up to two, plus two for shooting adjacent, plus one for moving units. They'd have um, a D6 plus five as their shot, probably, well, definitely. And there's no defensive terrain, so the defender would just be rolling a flat d6, and that looks like a really, really ugly proposition for the um, Australia and um, the New Zealanders. So they've got to contend with this group somehow and get it to do something. And the only way really to do that is to send some boys in to try and um, uh, to attack it. So I'm considering taking the scout. Um, and a squad with an M60 and assault moving them into here and then opening fire, you know, giving them their um, giving them their opportunity fire shot at us and then hoping to open fire. The other, I mean, I don't see another option. The other, I, a tentatively, another option would be to just move a assault move a group into here and take a shot into here and then perhaps another group down to try and clean up these and swing try and swing through the jungle this way and prevent them and engage them on our you know on more favorable terms without having to go out in the open you know they'll have to lead the prisoners into the jungle and we could hope to try and attack them while they were doing that um that is a possibility i suppose um so we could try perhaps running with the scout through the woods coming up here. But then if we come in here, we are going to take an opportunity fire shot, but it's not going to be so bad because they're changing. But then if we come, oh, I suppose we could run through here. One, two, three, four, five. But, you know, we're just leaving ourselves open to being ambushed you know, with no opportunity fire capability. So that doesn't look like a great proposition either. All in all, it's a pretty sticky situation for the um, New Zealanders here. I think our original plan of trying to engage these and then having to try and get in and rescue the aircrew now is the only option. I think if the VC get a turn with the aircrew under their control, um, they're going to be able to set up situations that make it even more difficult for us to recover because um, they can march them this way and yeah down th just straight down here we can't fire at them in the open and then what are we going to do once they're down here that's that's even less it's even less plausible that we that we can we can get to them um so i think I think the scout is going to um, 
pick a squad with an M60 and lead them off through the jungle this way. Um, uh, as, with an assault move and then into here with an assault move. So let's mark them with an assault move marker. Um, this is where the X maps with the bigger hexes come in handy because you can have markers next to next to things um, and so I suppose it's a question um, there is a question as to whether we're assault moving with these or not though and I suppose that if we didn't assault move, then uh, the VC would definitely op, op fire because it would be obvious that they were going to try and engage us in melee and therefore they would definitely opportunity fire us at this point. Given that Given that they know we they can't we can't get to them because we've assault moved um, and we've used our two movement points. The question is whether the VC hold off on their up fire because they want the opportunity to open fire at anything that tries to recover the prisoners. The the difficulty for them then is that they're giving us a free shot um, without using their firepower at all, and that free shot is going to be three firepower minus one for uh, sorry minus two for having a salt move so a plus one and we've got a plus three for the defense from the jungle we might be comfortable taking that shot and keep our powder dry I think we will I think we will so the um, New Zealanders are going to take a shot at us having a salt moved um, I wonder what the back of this says now, no crawl. Okay, so we've assault moved and we're now going to fire um, at the VC who are spotted by virtue of being adjacent to us. So, like I say, we've got three firepower, minus two for the assault move is one firepower and the, on the green dice for the Americans, uh, three defense for the VC. Let's see how this comes out. Okay, that's terrible. So that's a four for the Americans and a nine for the VC, and they are completely untroubled by that, that fire in the jungle. And it's now the VC's um, opportunity to act. And I don't think they want to. I think they're happy to pass and, and put the onus on the uh, Anzacs to do something. Um, and so they have now got to uh, try and recover the aircrew. They really do. I don't see an alternative for them. So it's just gone. It's just gone quite badly but but Lovell is going to have to play the hero here and so come in here for two and at that point I think this guy will op fire at him um, one firepower no modifiers oh he's moving so um he's got a dice plus one dice plus two and he's got a dice plus one for the no dice plus two for heavy jungle so they're both on a d6 plus two and the americans uh get seven to five and are sorry i could say americans um because a lot of the troops in this game are americans the new zealanders are fine there and are then going to push on into here um, and melee. I'm just going to mark them 
pops complete for a, for a moment. Uh, but we've got a melee going on there. Um, so they've got three firepower against one. So three to one um, means they need a five or more. They've got a plus one for having the leader with them. Uh, so they need a four or better. And they've got a five plus one. So they're going to destroy the, um, the VC unit in melee here. The VC, however, uh, get an opportunity. They are at one to three. Uh, they need an 11 or 12 um, to kill the Anzac squad. They've got a nine. I saw that six come down and I feared the worst. Um, they've got a nine. That is not enough. So we have our first casualties. Um, this VC squad is uh, killed and the aircrew is momentarily rescued. And we will mark those ops complete. And this initiative switches over to the VC side and this could get pretty unpleasant now. Um, these VC will open fire. <clears throat> they've got two firepower. Well, they've got one and a half. One plus a half, rounded up to two. They've got a plus two for, um, we should actually mark those moved really, rather than ops complete, because it matters for the fire calculations. So um, <clears throat> we've got the two firepower, plus two for an adjacent target, plus one for a moving target is plus five. Um, and they've got no cover at all. So it's just a plus five on the white dice and a, plus, and a flat roll on the green dice and we'll see what we get. Okay, so that's seven to four. Uh, that's a plus three damage check for everything in the hacks. So if I just leave the moved marker down here, let's just pop these down here. So we've got level, we've got a squad with an M60 and we've got the air crew. Okay, so we're rolling a D6 plus three and comparing it to the morale basically. Let's start with level then. Um, he gets a three, plus three is six. His morale is six. Um, less than or equal to morale is no effect, so he's fine. Um, the squad with the 60 gets a four, plus three is seven, and they are shaken. And the crew get a four plus three is seven, and I assume they are shaken as well. They are all shaken. You can see they're now not allowed to fire. They've got no range and they've got a move of two. But Lovell is still in good order and so can attempt to rally them if they get through the turn. Um, I'm not sure they're going to though, but there we go. Um, because the um, Anzacs haven't got anything left to move and now um, Arna is going to come in and come one, two, three straight through the open terrain. This will count as an ambush because they didn't have line of sight to her. Um, uh, at the start of the VC impulse, because she was back here, so she wasn't spotted, they had no line of sight to her, um, and she just gets to ambush them there. Um, yeah, 
I'll come back when I've um, just figured out exactly how this is going to work, but it's going to be a bloodbath. I think with uh, shaken units, they're not going to have... Um, I'm not even sure they've got any defensive firepower at all. I think they may just auto-lose this, but I'll have to check. Yeah, so this combat's very simple. If you enter a hex and there's no melee eligible units in it, if every enemy unit is non-melee eligible, non eligible, then everything's eliminated. Now, shaken units are non-melee eligible. And um, single man counters without their own squad weapon, in other words, without having firepower of their own provided by squad weapon, weapons are non melee eligible um the crew is shaken so they are uh, non-melee eligible these guys are non-melee eligible and he's not eligible so um we can just uh, eliminate these um we can leave the m60 and we can recapture this crew. I mean, we could eliminate the crew, but we will just, I think we'll recapture the crew because that is worth lots of VPs for us. Um, so there we are. Um, that We have to understand that M60 is not, is not possessed by anyone at the moment. And we are marked with a melee counter. And we are done. That is the end of turn three. Um, you can see this moves r fairly rapidly and is um, often uh, quite um, chaotic, which is brilliant. So uh, on to turn four. Well, the VC won a critical initiative at the start of turn four and Arnat just moved um, with her squad with the BAR and the captured air crew out through the jungle, the Aussies couldn't risk, so Aussies, New Zealanders couldn't risk fire. I'm calling them Americans and Aussies. I'm sure any New Zealand viewers are going to be absolutely delighted with that. Anyway, um, the New Zealand Anzacs um, couldn't risk firing at them, even though they had a clear shot into here, um, because there's captured troops in there. They move into the jungle, they move into the light jungle. Um, these guys can't even really catch them up even if they skirted and took the um even if they skirted and took the opportunity fire and came one two three four they still couldn't catch them up these guys they would need to do that and then win initiative and then win a melee combat i mean it's not a good look for them it's not a good um you can't make a good case for that being viable play. Um, but that, on the other hand, is six six victory points walking off the board there. Um, um, the VC already have four to their two. That's going to make it ten VPs. They're going to have to do good work in wiping out um, the C squads to make up for this um, capture. But I think that is their best option at this point. Um, they perhaps can put some damage uh, on on the on the VC squad. So uh, maybe they'll try and do that and and take some take some revenge by trying to eliminate some some VC. There's a captured M60 in here, squad with a captured M60 in here. So I think what they're going to do instead of running around the jungle. Um, chasing ghosts is um, try and just waste this guy. So they've got um, three firepower here. They've got uh, an adjacent target who's spotted by virtue of being in the open. Uh, this guy's spotted by being adjacent, but these guys are not spotted So um, at the moment. Anyway, three firepower. Adjacent is a plus five in the open. Um, so let's take that shot and see what happens. Green die is the um, green die is the New Zealanders as usual. That is ten attack 
and three defense, so that's a plus seven damage roll. Um, three plus seven is ten. Uh, and ten is two and a half times their morale, so they are take, replaced by a shaken half squad. So that is some casualties. Um, and let's put a half squad casualties in their casualty pile and let's put a shaken half squad in there and we go over to the VC side who perhaps realizing what is happening are going to start to withdraw through the jungle so as not to incur too many more casualties so let's get out of here um, one two three Okay, the Anzacs here can assault move into here and then fire, but they will have to take, again, is this guy going to stand around and fire or is he going to, is he going to leave? Um, there's another guy here, no, he's going to, he's going to hold fire and let this guy fire at him. So he's going to assault move, fire. He's got one plus two for adjacent is three. Minus two for uh, assault moving is one. And this guy's got a defense from the jungle of plus two. So plus one for the Anzax, plus two for the VC. And that's uh success for the VC who now are just going to slide back through the jungle to here and even though this guy can come forward we, you can pretty much see now that this is a forlorn um, situation for the for the uh, for the New Zealanders um, this group can essentially block off routes to, um, you know, that would be two actions, but all the uh, uh, Anzacs have acted. So, you know, they can essentially cut off routes to get through to um, to try and melee uh, there. And essentially at this point, it's all over because these guys are leaving the map this turn for six victory points. And there's really, very few ways to engage uh, there's someone at my door so that's that so as I was saying I don't think there's any real further possibility of um, of uh, the uh, the Anzacs preventing a, a, a resounding VC victory here they can simply withdraw take their six victory points and keep moving away um, through the, slipping through the jungle um, as we've seen, um, not much more to be done here. So um, that was uh, Lock and Low Tactical Heroes of the Narm. This is a, um, a highly replayable scenario by virtue of the fact that the uh, the American air crew can move in all kinds of different ways and, and the combination of that and the initiatives that we got uh, le left the um, New Zealand forces in an extremely tricky position in this one. But, you know, you play it a different, uh, you play it, uh, you know, at another time and the air crew wanders a different way and the initiatives work out differently. And it's the VC with all the problems to solve of how to try and capture them with, um, with lots of... Uh, heavily armed New Zealand troops with M60s uh, sitting in wait for them. So, um, yeah, a, a nice illustrative game, uh, an easy one to put on camera. Uh, I hope it's given a flavour for the system. I've played four or five scenarios from this, um, from this book and uh, really enjoyed them all and really enjoyed the system. The reason I played this one is that um, a lot of scenarios have event chits and... Um, markers on the map which then lead to paragraphs that you read in the book um, 
that add new forces or change the battle or produce all the kinds of chaos that you get in Vietnam with ambushes and, uh, you know, other firefights going on that introduce new troops and all kinds of stuff can happen. So you can have these, um, you can have these markers like this, I don't see that, like event C, line of sight. And when a unit has line of sight to the line of sight marker, then you read that C paragraph in the book and it says, you can see a whole firefight going on over that hill with some NVA ambushing some, um, you know, ARVN forces or whatever. Um, so I, I didn't want to play a scenario from the book that would contain uh, spoilers of those paragraphs. And so that's why I chose this one, which is a very plain, straightforward uh, fight. There's another uh, one called River of Perfume, which is uh, also similar and, and very good. Um, it's a bit uh, ASL-ish in that it's got more buildings and stone buildings, and so the terrain is um, very heavy and the firepower isn't... The, the, the It reminded me of the Guards counterattack a little bit in that the, the, the firepowers are, don't really allow you to get through the stone buildings. And the buildings, I think, play... A, you know, a, an outsized role in in that one. I liked it as a scenario, but I think I prefer this one because there's just more fluidity and nuance um, rather than hunkering down in a stone building and hoping that the plus four it gives you is uh, enough defense. Uh, so here I like the fluidity of it and the and the maneuver of it. I love the, the scout um, function and the way he combines with leadership and the you know that that that's really potent you didn't see it here but it is it can be really potent anyway that's been um lock and load tactical heroes of the nam a very brief taste uh, i may come back with some more of this but i've got um loads of exciting stuff uh, to play at the moment some of which i may film ha. anyway onward <laughs>